I'm Tony Perkins, president of the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C., with this year's State of Faith, Family, and Freedom in America. The Apostle Peter wrote to believers who had been scattered about because of the persecution of the early church, instructing them to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, notice where that hope was to reside. Not in the halls of power, the media headlines of the day, and certainly not on the stages of entertainment. But rather, that hope is found within us. As followers of Christ, we have the very presence of God within us, which is our hope and our confidence. And in a moment, I want to share with you the tangible results that have come from that hope, results which the godless left in their lemmings in the legacy media work day and night to keep from you. So, with that foundation, we look at the state of faith, family, and freedom in America. The assault on biblical faith continues to accelerate under the Biden administration's policies, both at home and abroad. Religious freedom, the top foreign policy objective of the former Trump administration, has been replaced with prioritizing attacks on the unborn, LGBTQ ideology, and the climate, what I call the unholy trinity of the left. The Biden administration has found the ideal partner to advance the unholy trinity with the World Health Organization, the WHO, which is working, by the way, feverishly to advance an unprecedented global power grab through a pandemic treaty or pandemic accord, as it is deceptively being called, and that's so they can avoid the ratification necessary by the U.S. Senate. This accord grants the compromised WHO the ability to regulate nearly every aspect of life for citizens of every nation when the WHO believes there is a health emergency or they just decide to declare one. Now, the treaty calls for censoring information that would challenge WHO's declaration, which would include silencing dissenting voices. Now, we saw this type of totalitarianism play out here in the United States during COVID-19. We don't want to see a global sequel. The consequences of the Biden administration's misplaced priorities have rapidly manifested in global chaos and instability, along with historical levels of persecution of Christians and other religious minorities. A case in point is the country of Nigeria, the most populous African nation. As chairman of the bipartisan U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom during the Trump administration, I led the commission in recommending to the Trump administration that Nigeria be designated as a country of particular concern. This designation, which the Trump administration adopted for the first time for the government of Nigeria, allowed for economic sanctions upon the country and its leaders for allowing egregious, ongoing, and systematic persecution of people of faith. But without adequate explanation, that designation was immediately removed by the Biden administration when they came into office. The result has been a dramatic rise in the death toll. According to the International Society for Civil Liberties and the Rule of Law, more than 8,000 Christians were killed in Nigeria last year alone. Now, this indifference to religious freedom abroad is rivaled only by the hostility toward religious freedom here at home. As a congressional investigation revealed, the FBI tracked and worked to infiltrate churches, in part because of leftist propaganda from the Southern Poverty Law Center, which the Biden administration is aligned with. The role of faith, the Christian faith, has been routinely undermined by President Biden's policy. Faith-based entities focused on proclaiming truth through charitable service have been assaulted. At the end of last year, the Biden Department of Health and Human Services put forth a new rule that would shut down Christian foster care services and exclude Christian foster families unless they surrender biblical teaching on human sexuality and gender identity. And this comes at a time when more, not fewer, stable families are needed for children in need of families. Now, these policies, which are hostile to biblical truth, have fomented and tacitly approved outright acts of hostility toward churches here in America. Over the last year, 
There have been 436 identified attacks on churches in the U.S., ranging from vandalism to firebombing to shootings. Family Research Council's recently released Hostility Against Churches report shows an astounding 800% increase in acts of vandalism and violence toward churches since 2018. The family has not evaded the hostility of this administration either, as radical gender policies are pushed from the Department of Education onto local schools, demanding parents be kept in the dark as their children are transitioned. Ask Jennifer and Dan Mead, whose autistic daughter was being secretly transitioned at school without her parents' knowledge or consent. Behind their backs, teachers agreed to call her by a masculine name and male pronouns. Now, the Meads just happened to stumble on the truth when an education plan that detailed their daughter's life as a boy at school was accidentally sent home. Furious, they pulled their daughter out of classes, started homeschooling, and they sued. Now, her mom says she's safe. She knows her real identity. But who knows how many other parents are living this same nightmare? Or worse oblivious to what's happening right under their noses. Well, the hostility of the left begins at the moment of conception. I mean, think about it. Vice President Kamala Harris told reporters recently after the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos are persons, quote, individual couples who want to start a family are now being deprived of access to what can help them start a family, she said referring to the potential impacts on uh, this decision on in vitro fertilization. So on the one hand, she goes on to say, the proponents are saying that an individual doesn't have a right to end an unwanted pregnancy, and on the other hand, the individual does not have a right to start a family, end quote. This faux outrage is the height of hypocrisy. First, the Alabama ruling did nothing to outlaw IVF. To the contrary, it ensured that parents struggling with infertility don't experience even more heartbreak because of the carelessness of IVF clinics that treat embryos as if they were merely pieces of property. This feigned counterfeit compassion over infertility comes at the same time the Biden administration is working to overturn every state's pro-life laws by allowing dangerous mail-order abortions without medical oversight which is also a violation of federal law. And once again, they are peddling the lie, the big lie, that protecting unborn children puts women's lives at risk. Not a single pro-life law prohibits saving the life of a mother. Instead, these laws protect unborn children from being brutally torn apart. Innocent human life must be protected, as must the mothers, many of whom think they have no alternative. That's why Republicans are working to stop the Biden administration and its new temporary assistance for needy families program from excluding pregnancy resource centers from receiving federal funding for a myriad of services that they provide to people. More and more families are looking to these religious nonprofits for assistance. And, and in fact, it's in many areas because families are struggling under the present tight economy where prices have climbed 18% since President Biden took office. And prices aren't the only thing increasing under this administration. So has violent crime. While the Democratic Party wants you to believe that crime has declined over the past year, the reality is that homicides, theft, carjackings, and property damage are astronomically higher than they were in 2019. Violent crimes against young people have actually doubled in the last year. Motor vehicle thefts are up 105% since the pandemic, as even members of Congress have fallen prey to carjackings. The murder rate is up as much as 30% in places like the nation's capital and about 18% overall. 
Now, a contributing factor to violent crime is the skyrocketing illegal immigration on our southern border. Made tragically evident again when 22-year-old nursing student Lakin Riley was found murdered on the campus of the University of Georgia. The alleged murderer, Jose Abrera, illegally entered the country in 2022 from Venezuela. He was detained and then let loose, or paroled as they say, into the U.S. This man, who was arrested three times, but never detained. And by the way, Athens, Georgia, where the campus is located, is a sanctuary city. A sanctuary for criminals and murderers, not nursing students and law-abiding citizens. An estimated 10 million, 10 million illegal immigrants have crossed into the U.S. since President Biden took office in January of 2021. Deadly drugs like fentanyl are also streaming across the border, becoming the number one killer of Americans aged 18 to 45. And it's not just drugs and criminals that are streaming across the border. So are terrorists. At least 342 individuals who are on the terrorist watch list have been detained at the border. Now, there's no telling how many terrorists have gotten into this country by evading authorities and are now in the U.S. establishing terrorist cells. We don't have to look back very far into history to see the savagery of terrorist border invasions. We simply look at October the 7th in Israel when Hamas terrorists invaded peaceful Israeli communities and brutally tortured, maimed, raped, and killed 1,400 innocent people, men, women, and children, and took 240 hostages. And now, five months later, as Israel seeks to secure its borders and eliminate future threats from Hamas, the Biden administration is breaking with one of America's most politically reliable and spiritually significant allies. The Biden administration has repeatedly called for pauses or ceasefires, which allows Hamas to regroup and resupply, even as American hostages have not yet been freed. Now, most recently, the Biden administration reversed the policy of the Trump administration that recognized Israel had a right to build in the biblical areas of Samaria and Judea, misleadingly called the West Bank. Now, President Biden has gone so far as to sanction Israelis living in these areas while giving billions of dollars to organizations like the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees that have been directly linked to Hamas and the October 7th terrorist attacks. Friends, I, I believe America's support for and stand with Israel has resulted in God extending grace to America despite our accelerating departure from his truth over the last half century. America's future is inextricably intertwined with Israel's. We look at and consider these challenges and we do so knowing that we are a people who have hope, hope to overcome. Jesus, in the parable about the unjust judge, which is an appropriate analogy as we consider our relationship to our government, said men should always pray and not lose heart or hope. Now, Jesus was not simply laying out a prescription to simply feel good. This call to prayer was a prescription for change. And let, let me give you just a few facts about the change God has brought forth in our nation because Christians didn't give up hope. Instead, they continued to pray, vote, and stand for biblical truth. On June 24, 2022, after 49 years of prayerful, disciplined, and often ridiculed political engagement, Roe v. Wade was overturned, putting the ability to protect women and unborn children into the hands of the elected representatives of the people rather than unelected judges. And here's something I'm sure you've yet to hear from the legacy media. We have more Bible-believing Christians in Congress, 
in state legislatures, on city councils, and serving on school boards than in any time in modern history. Look at the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, a Christian, a conservative, a Republican. I know Speaker Johnson. He and I have been friends for over 25 years. Look at the transformation of state legislatures across the country. In 1990, there were six, six GOP-controlled legislatures. 24 years later, there are 28. And one result has been state pro-life laws have doubled since the Republican election wave of 2010. We know that we will overcome. That is why we must continue to pray for our nation that we will return to God and His truth. We need to vote. We need to both raise up and vote for leaders who have the qualities that Jethro laid out to Moses in Exodus 18. Leaders who are able, they know what to do. Leaders who fear God. Men of truth and those who are not looking to get rich, but rather they are seeking to serve. Finally, we need to stand for truth, no matter who else is standing or not standing, and do so filled with the joy of the Lord. In John 15, as Jesus was warning his disciples of the challenges that they would face for following him, he said this in John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And we do all of this in love. Paul instructs us in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 to watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. The state of faith, family, and freedom in America is being tested and tried to a degree that is almost unrivaled in our history. But our confidence and hope in the future has never been more solid because we've seen the budding fruit of decades of prayer and of biblically guided participation in our Republican form of government. We must let it be known that we will not be intimidated into silence by a weaponized government, nor will we allow Marxist tactics that seek to marginalize the Christian faith to cause us to shrink back into the shadows of society. Why? Because of the hope that is within us and the victory that is before us. It leaves us more resolved than ever to pray, vote, and stand for biblical truth. Join me as I pray. Father, we thank you for this nation that you have placed us in. And Lord, we thank you that you've even entrusted to us this moment in human history. Yes, there are challenges all about, but we have hope within us because you are our God. And we do not back away and we do not shrink into the shadows, nor will we go silent just because our faith is attacked, mocked, or ridiculed. We will not deny our Savior. And so we pray for the strength of the Holy Spirit for the courage to stand for truth in love. And we pray, Lord, that you would turn this nation back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America.